funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child, and RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, major flooding slams North Jersey, closing roads, taking out power, and leaving some drivers stranded. Plus, continued questions after the release of body camera footage showing the fatal shooting of a 25-year-old Fort Lee woman during what families say was a mental health crisis. This family put a lot of trust in, in our systems to help her get care, and instead uh, she was shot in her own front entryway. Also, a rise in senior scams. How can you stay safe and protect yourself amid the spike? If you're receiving phone calls, emails, uh, and you did not solicit those uh, emails or phone calls, uh, chances are they could be fraudulent. And Camden County health officials are trying to get ahead of the school year by kicking off a summer vaccine campaign. I want my child healthy, so it's good. If your kid's gonna be vaccinated on time, they can have a better immune to fight with the disease. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Monday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. We begin with a couple of big headlines to get you started. First, folks are still cleaning up today after a line of powerful storms hit North Jersey, causing another bout of flooding, leading to road closures and drivers who needed to either be rescued or abandon their vehicles. According to the National Weather Service, areas around the Passaic River were slammed with more than four inches of rain. Patterson, Passaic, Basking Ridge and Mountainside were among the hardest hit. Flash flooding caused partial or full closure of several roads in Patterson and Passaic cities. It was a wild scene in East Rutherford along Hackensack Street, which was fully underwater. Now, forecasts show another front is pushing through tonight, so there is a chance for more flooding in areas where water hasn't receded. Another story we're following tonight, disgraced U.S. Senator Bob Menendez has officially ended his half-century career in politics. Just hours before the Friday deadline, Menendez pulled his name from the November ballot where he had planned to run for re-election as an independent. Menendez sent a letter via email to the State Division of Elections requesting his name be removed. It came on the same day Governor Murphy appointed his former chief of staff, George Helmy, to fill the seat until voters elect a permanent replacement in the fall. Menendez, of course, in July was found guilty of 16 felony counts, including taking bribes and acting as a foreign agent of Egypt. He'll formally resign from the Senate tomorrow and is scheduled to be sentenced in late October. It's a stunning ending for someone who wielded immense power in both state and federal politics for decades. And more calls for law enforcement reforms after Friday's release of Fort Lee police body camera footage, which revealed officers arriving on scene in response to a request for help in a mental distress call. Little to no action taken to de-escalate the situation and roughly two and a half minutes later resulted in 25-year-old Victoria Lee being fatally shot to the chest. Social justice and other advocates in the Asian American community have been holding rallies and vigils demanding police to be held accountable. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan has more reaction tonight as the investigation continues. Fort Lee police body cam show the rapid escalation of officers response to a July 28th call for help with a young woman in the throes of a mental health crisis. I'm going to break the door down. Go ahead, I'll stab you in the neck. Sir. We don't want to shoot you. We want to talk to you. Only about 10 seconds elapses between the final door knock and the fatal gunshot that kills 25 year old Victoria Lee. Open the door! Drop the weapon! We're going to break the door! I look at that video and I see a scared young woman who's, who's well aware of the risks of. Um, 
encounters with police who's experiencing one of the worst moments of her life. Amber Lee Reed advocates for Jersey's Asian American Pacific Islander community. She says a growing chorus of critics claim police overreacted to Lee's mental health meltdown and that the body cam video released Friday only underscores their concerns. This family put a lot of trust in, in our systems to help her get care and instead uh, she was shot in her own front entryway. The attorney general reported police took Lee to the hospital where she later died. It's a scenario her brother feared when he first called 911 asking for just an ambulance. The dispatcher insisted. It's a mental health, we have to send officers also. Oh, okay. For the safety of the ambulance where they have to send them, so we'll send both over for. But as her family waited at the Lee's Pinnacle apartment complex, Victoria's brother called 911 again, trying unsuccessfully to cancel the request for help. He told the dispatcher his sister wasn't violent, but had a, quote, folding knife. Responding officers took only a few seconds to decide on lethal force. Okay. Okay. Lethal? Yeah, please. Please. Lethal? After pushing the door open, officer Tony Pickens Jr. fires the single shot. It's tough to see on the video, but at this point, the family maintains Lee was only holding an empty five-gallon water bottle. Where's the knife? Where's the knife? <laughs> With Lee down and bleeding, police scrambled to assist, called for towels before carrying Lee outside. Generally, police will... I think negotiate with the person that's behind the door, um, sort of like in a quasi hostage situation, but they didn't even do that. And here it was a family that was actually trying to get help. Victoria had received help in the past. And so it just truly is tragic. I've heard from various community leaders that people in Fort Lee are now afraid to call 911. NJ Spotlight News reporter Taylor Chung says Asian Americans are particularly reluctant to seek mental health services. She reviewed the tapes and saw no real attempt to de-escalate the situation. That despite a statewide officer training program and initiatives like Arrive Together, promoted by Attorney General Matt Platkin, Arrive integrates mental health experts into police crisis response teams. I was dis made. I couldn't believe the overreach of force that was used in that tape. Montclair's professor Jason Williams notes Fort Lee's still in the process of implementing an Arrive Together protocol, which he thinks might have saved Victoria Lee. Unfortunately, I mean, this was a textbook case of all that is wrong, unfortunately, with our policing, you know, with, with police in the country. And just the fact that it appears that they didn't even try to de-escalate, it, it's, it's very, very troubling. New Jersey State Office of Public Integrity and Accountability will investigate the case before it goes before a grand jury. That could take months. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. This incident is also putting renewed focus on the number of civilians who've been killed as a result of interactions with law enforcement. Statewide data show New Jersey police have shot and killed five people so far in 2024. It's fewer civilian deaths than at this time last year, but the data also points out that two of those shot by police are believed to have been in mental distress. An NJ Spotlight News analysis dug deeper, looking at statistics for the last five years and found 30 percent of fatal police shootings in the state were likely linked to a mental health crisis, prompting social justice advocates to call on law enforcement to do more to prevent these tragedies. Senior writer Colleen O'Day is with me now to share her reporting and why pinning down this data isn't so easy. Colleen, you did a lot to get these numbers, including uh, going back through press releases from the attorney general's office. Why don't they have this in a public database? That is a really good question that I would love to get an answer to. We did not get an answer to that question when we asked the attorney general's office. So you can look at this, the use of force database that is available, which is a method of transparency, something that we've had for a few years now. And you can see when there's been a gunshot, um, you can see whether a person has been arrested, but there's no, it doesn't say gunshot death. And for arrest, what, what has happened is if a person has died, then they're typically not arrested. So you may often see gunshot, no arrest, but you can't be sure that that's the case. Why not just come out and say it? It's, it, it's mind boggling, I don't know. And so then based on the numbers that you did find and you were able to analyze, 
what does it tell us about these incidents and specifically the ones that end tragically in a death? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it, there are a couple of ways that they're characterized. You can have something that police would uh, call a mental health incident, uh, a welfare check. Both of those are people, you know, either saying or police finding out from someone that there may be a problem here. A and there are others, though, that we did characterize, not many, because we tried to be very cautious, but, I mean, I think an incident where someone is walking around town with a machete, um, that might come in as a police call for a disturbance, but it, it just certainly seems like an incident where there was likely a mental health mm -hmm. issue happening there. There are not really clear and fast rules for how some of these things are characterized. So that leads to some fuzziness about how many. I mean, there could be more than 30 percent. And so then that begs the question about the training, because uh, you made me think of a couple of the incidents you wrote about. Y you know, this incident in Fort Lee certainly is different than um, a man where police were called he had a, a running chainsaw in his hands, right? right? I mean, there are all different categories of the level of threat, um, both to public, to that person, and to police. But do police have the right tools at their disposal? This is, of course, the question on everyone's mind. I mean, I think the answer would have to be no. Um, there is some training that police have to go through. Uh, it's, it's not very long. Uh, and w I think we're still uncertain at this point whether it's something that has to happen every year, every five years, every 10 years, or do you just go through it once? I think that we are asking police to do an awful lot of things that maybe they didn't do 20 years ago, including be mental health experts. And we have the Arrive Together program in the state. Not every town has it. Fort Lee, for instance, the police were not part of that. But, you know, certainly the folks that I've talked to have said that having a mental health professional come in and arrive with police or shortly thereafter is something that, you know, can help. And there is data that shows New Jersey has helped to um, prevent some of these, you know, terrible tragedies. Yeah, and, and does it make a bigger difference in, say, communities where there are more people of color? Did your analysis show us anything about how they are affected? I mean, it's certainly, we, our analysis shows that, yes, 40% um, of those who have been shot and killed by police were um, black African American, and that's way out of proportion with the population in the state. Um, whether those things would help, I mean, I certainly think that it's worth looking into, and social justice advocates say that they ab absolutely, these programs should be in place in communities, um, large communities of color, to prevent these kinds of incidents. Uh, all of the breakdown of your analysis is on our website in your article. Colleen O'Day, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Bree. The FBI is warning Americans of an uptick in scams targeting older people. According to the agency's latest fraud report, scammers stole roughly $3.4 billion out from seniors last year. Investigators say it may be just the tip of the iceberg, and a new survey put together by AARP backs up the concerns, showing a stunning amount of adults have had personal experience with fraud. The state director of AARP New Jersey, Chris Widello, joins me with more on what scams to look for and how you can prevent it. Chris, thanks for coming on. I'm curious to know what type of scams are we seeing that are most prevalent uh, affecting older Americans, older New Jersey residents? Sure, thanks for having me, Brianna. Um, I, I think scams we find are uh, impacting four in 10 uh, Americans and uh, you know they range from uh, mail to uh, even uh, online, which is uh, one of the uh, ones that we see the most of. So why are they being targeted? Is it because they are presumed to have chunks of retirement savings, these nest eggs? Is that why folks are fraudsters are going after them? Yeah, honestly, they do have, you know, they tend to have um, some income and they or they have some savings. And, you know, these fraudsters are just very well trained in, in doing this. Um, you know, they've they've really taken the time to come up with these scams that, um, you know, may seem legitimate. Right. Like they might seem like a legitimate ask or uh, something that's too good to be true. And often uh, people kind of fall under this ether of, uh, you know, fear of missing out or, you know, there's this really great opportunity and I need to take advantage of it. I don't want to miss out. Um, and they don't do their homework. Mm, OK, so give us some examples of the types of scams you've seen or signs that folks should look for if they do get pinged in their email or, you know, worse, a, a phone call. 
So the good news is uh, many older adults are now aware of things where you're making a, a very quick financial decision uh, and you're being asked to send uh, you know, a gift card or a cryptocurrency. They, people are now recognizing that that is not the way to do uh, business. But I, I think that the best thing that folks can do is that if the information is being pushed out to them, somebody asking them for information, um, to really do your homework and to go and look and try, make sure that you're uh, you know, interacting with someone or something that's legitimate. Even if it's a, a, a trusted company, go to their website and look for the safe way to, to do business. Uh, but you know, if you're receiving phone phone calls, emails, uh, and you did not solicit those uh, emails or phone calls, uh, chances are they could be fraudulent. Yeah, so don't react. Think before you do so. But as you said, some of these scams are really sophisticated. They're using AI, you know, mimicking people's voices, those of, of a loved one. So what are other ways that folks can protect themselves? Sure. So I'd like to invite folks to check out our Fraud Watch Network at aarp.org slash Fraud Watch Network. And on that page, they have a list of uh, some of the latest scams and what to look out for. Um, you know, uh, don't make a, uh, I think, a, a, a decision, you know, in the moment. You know, take a deep breath. Uh, think about, you know, does this sound legitimate, right? Was, uh, often we hear about the grandparent scam, right? My child, my uh, grandchild's hurt. And like you said, with AI, they can, uh, you know, they can replicate voices and things like this. So um, we need to make sure that you, you know, do your homework, check in with that loved one and, you know, make sure that they're, they're in fact safe, but don't make any rash decisions. Um, you know, take the time to uh, make sure that things are, are uh, legitimate. It's good advice. Chris Widello is the state director for AARP New Jersey. Chris, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, it is going to take a lot more than lower mortgage rates to make homeownership more affordable. Thanks to a recent drop, rates are at their lowest level in more than a year. But at 6.5% on average, experts say people aren't necessarily racing to jump into the market. There are still a lot of other factors for prospective home buyers to contend with, namely limited inventory, record high prices, and lingering fears of a recession. So what does it mean for the future of the housing market? Ted Goldberg takes a look. It's no secret that for real estate, we're living in a seller's market. Despite interest rates being more than twice as high as what they were during the pandemic, the value of a home has continued to rise. It's not only New Jersey, but it's been a nationwide trend as well, Ted. Uh, and it's never happened before. Real estate experts like Jeffrey Otto say there could be some relief for home buyers in the coming months. The Federal Reserve Board meets in mid-September, and the decisions they make will have wide-ranging effects on the housing market. What we expect to see happen going forward is that interest rates will continue to fall. The inventory of houses on the market will rise, and home prices will slow below this very, very high rate of increase that we've been seeing in recent years. But that's not a perfect solution for people trying to buy a home. More buyers will jump into the market. And if that happens, it's going to keep the housing prices high. It could even increase the housing prices. Experts generally agree that housing is expensive, with mortgage rates so high and so few people trying to sell their homes. There's lots of people who kept refinancing or purchased at just the right time, and they might be at two and a quarter or two and a half percent. And then they look at rates at six percent, seven percent, seven and a half percent. And they're thinking, how do I sell my property to buy something to downsize? New Jersey home buyers have also faced competition from New Yorkers looking to leave the city. Originally, they were trying to escape from the high concentrations of COVID virus infections in New York City. Um, but with time, with uh, hybrid and work from home models, uh, high income households from New Jersey, from New York City, moved into New Jersey and caused home prices to inflate. In September, the Fed is expected to cut interest by a quarter of a percent, leaving it at around 6%. 
Ken Barris owns Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Jordan Barris Realty in North Jersey. As soon as rates dip below 5% again, you're going to see just a blizzard of real estate hitting the market. That's that psychological number and the mathematical number where somebody at 2.5% can still make a move and feel okay about it. Anything helps, but getting below 5% for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage is probably the point at which we'll see the market start to free up. These experts say potential home buyers should still dive in. Right now would be a great time for buyers to jump into the market. You know, there's always refinancing that they can do because once those interest rates come down, we're going to see an influx of buyers coming in. I would say buy something you like rather than rent something you love because you're going to love the equity over time. Every time you rent, you're helping to build equity in somebody else's property. Why not do it in your own home? The Fed factors in several variables when deciding to cut interest rates. Unemployment numbers and inflation play a big part. So all eyes will be on the Fed in September to see if they will make more homeowners in New Jersey. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Ted Goldberg. Turning to Wall Street, the recovery rally continues and stocks climbed again today. Here's how the markets closed. And finally tonight, it may be hard to accept, but summer is winding down and back to school preparations are ramping up. So is the return of all those seasonal illnesses like flu, strep and COVID. Camden County launched a mobile clinic to make it easier for families to keep their kids up to date on vaccines this year. And as Raven Santana reports, there's no appointment or affiliation with a primary care doctor needed. I want my child healthy, so it's good. If your kid's gonna be vaccinated on time, they can have a better immune to fight with the disease. Kalsum Gafar says getting her four-year-old daughter vaccinated was on the top of her back to school to-do list, which is why she headed to this mobile van in Camden County, offering free vaccinations for uninsured children. We're offering the Tdap and DTAP vaccine, MMR, polio, and meningococcal vaccines. A lot of the people that we're seeing at our clinics don't have um, insurance, so they aren't able to go to their regular pediatricians. And another problem is that some pediatricians um, cannot offer the vaccines in their offices. Patricia Elliott is a nurse with the Camden County Department of Health, which partnered with other health care providers to offer a variety of required vaccinations in an effort to prepare families for the upcoming school year. Elliott and fellow nurse Anna Rodriguez say the vaccine clinics are in response to really low vaccine rates among children. It was prompted from vaccine school audits that uh, the county has um, done within the last two years. And we noticed there were a lot of children um, not sure if it was due to the pandemic, but post pandemic, there were missing vaccines that are mandatory here in the state of New Jersey. So we decided to come up with this mobile clinic where we could go to their backyards basically and meet parents where they're always at, right? Dropping kids off either at school programs, um, at uh, summer camps. Um, and that's how we came up with our locations. And according to state epidemiologist Tina Tan, vaccination rates for school aged children have not yet rebounded to pre-pandemic rates. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, we did see a dip in vaccine coverage um, overall um, among our school aged populations. Uh, and fortunately, we are starting to see a rebound, although it's a little uneven. So we definitely still have room for improvement in terms of getting uh, vaccinations um, uh, coverage uh, much higher and back to our pre-pandemic levels. It is really critical for us to get those immunization coverage rates um, much higher because we constantly face issues related to vaccine preventable diseases um, from a worldwide um, basis. We saw over this past spring that there was an uptick in measles cases globally. And um, we have a lot of travelers um, from New Jersey who go into areas where measles is a situation. And we are very concerned about bringing back measles into areas, particularly, particularly when people are un or under vaccinated.
In addition to the mobile van, the State Department of Health created Hot Shots for Tots campaign, which showcases child care and preschool facilities who can earn award levels for promoting best vaccination practices. Governor Murphy also recently marked August as Immunization Awareness Month. Still, even with all the initiatives, Rodriguez says barriers exist, which is why she believes meeting the community where they are will close the gaps. It can be um, the parents' work schedule. Um, sometimes there's Fear. There's kids who have anxiety or par pa uh, parents who um, have questions, doubts about the vaccine, whether they're effective or not. Um, so those could be barriers for children to be up to date. Rodriguez encourages any parents who are hesitant about giving their children the required vaccinations to contact their pediatrician and or the Department of Health. In the meantime, with school starting in just a few weeks, she and Elliot now hope to make the mobile van an annual back to school event. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. Support for the medical report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. That does it for us tonight. But before you go, a reminder to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen to us anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire team at NJ Spotlight News, thanks for being with us tonight. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, and by the PSCG Foundation. NJM Insurance Group has been serving New Jersey businesses for over a century. As part of the Garden State, we help companies keep their vehicles on the road, employees on the job, and projects on track. Working to protect employees from illness and injury, to keep goods and services moving across the state. We're proud to be part of New Jersey. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered.